throughout the region and will feature prominent guests in the Hudson Valley. Today I have with me four very interesting citizens. Donald Williams, who's the District Attorney of Ulster County. He has recently been elected to replace Mike Cavanaugh, a tough act to follow. Uh, Commander Alan Martin, who is the head of all the state troopers in five counties in the Hudson Valley. There is also Hope Nemiroff, who's working on a study for Benedictine Hospital that relates pesticide use in our region to breast cancer. And my last guest, but not least, is Rick Orlando, the proprietor of New World Home Cooking, one of my favorite restaurants in the Hudson Valley. Uh, this show is sponsored by Swedish Solutions Auto Repair, located off the Thruway Traffic Circle in Kingston, and I thank them for their support. With no further ado, I'd like to introduce Don Williams, who was good enough to take time out of his busy schedule to come and join me here. Thank you, Don. Thanks for having me, Joanne. Okay, I, I really always was interested, you know, I've had so many experiences with lawyers through, and judges, and um, many of them have been less than positive. But some, but good. I, <laughs> some good. Some good. And um, uh, one of the people I have tremendous respect for in our system is Mike Cavanaugh, and I know him from Woodstock. I see him in the morning at Maria's Bazaar where I have breakfast. And, uh, but you have been working for Mike for 20 years, isn't, it? isn't that it? It's, uh, it was 20 years, uh, January of this year, in fact. And, and it's, uh, it really was a tremendous opportunity to work for Mike. Uh, I consider him indeed my mentor. I also consider him a very dear friend. And uh, to have the opportunity to be exposed to him at all, for 20 years, uh, you've got to learn quite a bit, and he has a great deal to do with uh, where I am today. No, that's great. I also know he has a wonderful sense of humor. But um, uh, what I was going to ask you is, you aren't as well known as Mike, and I always said to, I said to Mike, well, who is this man replacing you? How long has he been working with you? And when he said 20 years, I was astonished. Well, they, they keep me in hiding, and perhaps that's one of the better aspects of being the chief assistant for 17 years is that you're not constantly exposed mm -hmm. to the, the public, uh, but uh, that's changing now, and, and it's something that uh, I'm dealing with. Right. Now, tell me what you like best about the job so far. What have you found? Well, it's something that I probably thought of doing for quite a bit of time, even before I became an assistant, uh, Joanne. It's, it's an opportunity to really uh, genuinely do something that, uh, that could possibly ha help the community. It's a chance to give things back to people and to support individuals that are innocent victims of crime. So it's, uh, it's, it's truly a rewarding experience to the extent that you can do something that can have a positive impact on people's lives. At the same time, it, uh, for that same reason, it's one of the toughest part, parts of the job uh, because uh, helping victims to get back on their feet to begin a, a new life also exposes you to the tremendous trauma psychologically and physically that uh, they've been, uh, that, that has occurred in their lives. Do you and feel you uh, <coughs> live through their sure. trauma? Sure. The first thing you're you were saying before we came on, how difficult it is sometimes for you during the days, that it's hard to be, is that part of the emotional? Sure. Um, you're trained in law school to put aside your emotions, but when you're handling individuals that are victims of child abuse, victims of domestic violence, individuals who've lost uh, a loved one as a result of a criminal act of another, you cannot help but to identify with those individuals and you take it home with you. Um, but at the same time, if you didn't do that, you would not be human yourself and, and then I don't think you would be doing the, a service to the community that you really should. No, I'm glad be a to robot. hear that. I'm glad to hear that. I, uh, in, in my experience, and many people <coughs> read in the newspaper all over about various cases that are fairly complex and, and, and disturbing. And you always wonder uh, how people are who in your position are affected by this, but I'm glad to see um, that you do feel that way. Uh, what changes, if any, would you make in the system? I mean, Mike was in place for many years, you know, entrenched. Sure was. Do you see yourself doing things any differently in any areas? Well, let me ask you a question, Joanne. Maybe <laughs> this is the best way to do it. Uh, obviously, I've worked with Mike for 20 years. I agree with so much of what mm -hmm. Mike did because I wouldn't stay with him if, had I not. Mm -hmm. I was his chief assistant for 17 of those 20. Um, 
and I'm also not a stupid man. Um, you don't tamper with success. You don't come into an office where an individual has been incredibly successful. Our office, if I have this chance, is not only one of the finest in the state, but I think the best. Mm -hmm. And the reason for that is because we have a tremendous staff of career prosecutors. We do things as a matter of what's right and just, not as a matter of what is politically expedient at the time. And for me to come in and tamper with that formula would be ignorant. At the same time, um, I'm not Mike Kavanaugh. He is truly an individual that I idolize, but I'm not Mike Kavanaugh. Mike Kavanaugh has certain talents that I do not. I have certain talents that Mike doesn't. Mm -hmm. And uh, we are different. Uh, and the law is a very strange body, as you know. The law is fortunately changing every day and changing for the better every day. So as a result of that, we have to evolve with the law. And many times, we take the position that we have to be in the forefront. We have to make the changes and let the law follow our lead. Mm -hmm. So sure, there will be changes. But uh, as long as uh, I continue the aggressive policies of representing and defending innocent victims of crime, as long as I continue some of the very strict policies and limited plea, limiting plea bargaining, as long as we continue some of the very successful programs that Mike has instituted, uh, we'll be fine. And I think the people in this community will be fine. Um, <coughs> one of the things I was uh, curious about is what brought you into this field in the first place? I mean, when you were a kid, did you say, I'm going to be a lawyer? <laughs> oh, gosh. Where, where did this all start? The question you ask, uh, why exactly I'm in this field for 20 years, is the same question that my wife asks me normally around 2.30 in the morning when I wake her. <laughs> um, so it's something I've heard frequently. It's something I've given a lot of thought to. And it's hard to exactly put your finger on the exact reason. I just know that uh, at the risk of sounding completely arrogant, I have a gift. Uh, and it's a gift of uh, being candid, uh, maintaining a very high degree of integrity, fighting very hard for what I believe to be right, uh, putting what is right above and beyond political aspirations. And then I've had the opportunity to learn from people like Joe Taraka, Frank Vogt, Mike Kavanaugh, and uh, more from Mike and, and Judge uh, Vote than from Joe Taraka, but as a result of my seeing... My Supreme Court judge. Okay. Am I, as I'm a sorry, result of seeing how they handle things and how they've changed over the period of time, I've learned a great deal. So, um, to answer the question I've tried to avoid, I think it's just something that I realized in an early age I had a gift for. So we, you I went to in. law school where? Uh, I went to Albany Law School. It's a part of Union Are University. Are you from Kingston? I was born and raised literally in the shadow of the courthouse. Brown Street. Oh, really? Yeah. It was exposed uh, to uh, uh, courtroom procedures. Was your father a lawyer? No. My father was an accountant. He was one tough cookie. He's passed away since. Uh, but he was a fighter, a real fighter, uh, an individual who was very small and had to fight for everything he received. The opposite end of the spectrum is my mom, who was 100% uh, purebred Italian that I'm very proud of, very emotional, very sympathetic, very compassionate. So I have the balance of uh, the genes from both sides and, uh, and then the environment of uh, working in front of people like Mike that has turned me into the person I am. Which I think the people that get to know me, uh, I can be very tough, sometimes too tough, but they know I'm honest and they know that mm -hmm. what I say, I stand for. Well, that's a rare thing and I, I guess in the months to come and the years to come, we will, that will be proven out if it, I'm sure it has already. Uh, in when you say, you, you, what's so interesting as somebody of my generation, you really were in the same job for 17 years, you came back to your hometown, you really, I mean most people have gone far afield or they have had, you've had a lot of stability it sounds to me. You seem like a man who knows what he wants. No, there's <laughs> not, that finds uh, it in, this is do you ever, you ever think of moving to Asia and like no, checking it all? No. <laughs> no. To begin with, uh, being born and raised in this community, mm -hmm. having developed incredible friendships with many people, uh, playing basketball for Kingston High School, uh, I've always wanted to stay here. I've never had any desire to go anywhere else. Uh, sometimes when it's 10 below zero and we have four feet of snow, I might think otherwise. But no, this is my hometown and this is where I was brought up. And I've seen uh, what has happened to the area and I'm still very proud of this area, proud of what uh, uh, the City of Kingston Police Department, with the State Police, with the Sheriff's Department and the other agencies in the county have, has done, but you can see that uh, there are problems that we can't just uh, be blind to. 
And the fact that I perhaps uh, can do something to try to rectify those problems, or at least to fight back, uh, it's something I want, and it's something I want to give back to the community. At the same time, I'm not naive. I don't think I'm going to be riding in on a white horse and shining armor and change everything that's occurred. I know that it took many, many years to develop the problems that we have here, and it's going to take many years to try to get back on the right road, but it's something I want to do. Well, what do you think really needs an area that needs work? Work in, in, the, in, the, in, criminal your area, in the criminal justice system. This is where my candor perhaps is going to cause all kinds of controversy, but uh, in the criminal justice system alone, um, the things that are most bothersome to me is that we see grand jurors, we see trial jurors on a regular basis, and we tell them, we preach to them that uh, trial is in, in reality a search for the truth. But then because of laws that are either archaic or laws that uh, make very little sense, we can't tell the jurors the very things that they need to know to make decisions right. in cases. And you're talking to a prosecutor. I'm not a defense Well, attorney. I think that's part of when the whole country was watching the Simpson trial, which was uh, some of these things where I think we all got a lesson in law and in these kinds of things, which some things were the right thing to be given mm -hmm. out, and yet it had to be withheld, or there were technical sure. legal reasons. Absolutely. <laughs> I agree with you. I think what one of the things, I think, is that truth is irrelevant often in a court of law. Well, I truth still have is not mm -hmm. really. See, that's what's so often so problematical and astonishing to those who go through it, I whether you're going through it for an, in a civil sure. area like I was. But yes, I think mm -hmm. I empathize. Well, I, can, <laughs> I, I can't agree that truth becomes irrelevant, but I, often, what I'm saying I is, said, often what is can irrelevant. happen, what can happen, Joanne, and what is frustrating to we as prosecutors, perhaps, is to tell jurors that they should use their God-given common sense in reaching these decisions, the same decisions they make in every day of their lives when determining an individual's credibility. And then to have a defendant take the stand in a criminal trial who is being tried for forcible rape and not being able to ask that defendant about prior convictions right. for rape, that is offensive to right. me. It's absurd. And, and I understand the reasons for it because the, the courts... But do you think that could be changed? I don't think you're ever going to see it changed under the system that we have now. Um, Why? Oh, gosh, uh, here we go. Uh, unfortunately, um, the appellate courts, who are fine, fine people, extremely intelligent people, individuals that are very well-meaning and work hard to protect the rights of innocent people. Sometimes they get lost and uh, they fail to deal. They In don't the technicalities deal. of the law. Sure, they don't mm -hmm. deal with people, victims, well, defendants. Well, if one of their daughters got raped, you would see a very different, and I have talked to people who have been that road. They then I don't want to be that cynical, Joanne, I, because they really work help? hard. They I, work I agree hard. with you. They, they work, work hard, hard, but and I'm there's sure an they intellectual and a, an intellectual dealing with a problem, and there's the real dealing with the problem, and I don't have to tell you sure. <laughs> about Well, that. I think that uh, having majored in philosophy in college, uh, <laughs> I can understand the, all of the relevant theories of how many angels can dance on a head of a pin, but quite frankly, I don't give a damn. I'd rather deal with reality, deal with common sense, mm -hmm. and deal with people. And I'm not... Uh, I'm not an individual who, I'm, I'm conservative. I cannot deny that I'm conservative in my profession. But what does that mean? Well, it means, in, in my viewpoint, I believe strongly in upholding laws that are on the books. I believe strongly in aggressively, aggressively defending innocent victims' lives. Uh, but at the same time, I'm also capable of tempering that zeal with a very, uh, a very candid degree of what fair play is, and I believe in that. But fair play does not enter into the equation to me when we prevent jurors from hearing fully everything about everybody. And I'm talking also about witnesses. Right. Uh, jurors should get to know about prosecution witnesses also. At the same time, I understand completely what the appellate courts do. I mean, their fear is that a jury, if hearing about a defendant's prior convictions for rape, will base the decision solely on, upon the prior convictions and not about the instant right. case. Right. No, I understand that. But then again, you know, everybody has to look at it like you say, the common sense way. It's sure. outrageous. And, and, and this is what's frustrating many it's, American citizens. It's one of like many me. frustrations. <laughs> the exclusionary <laughs> rule has caused me to lose probably a substantial amount of hair that what remaining hair I have on my head. <laughs> well, listen, um, you've been terrific, and I appreciate your taking time out of your busy day no to come problem. down here and talk with me.
My and pleasure. enlighten our fellow citizens as to uh, what goes into some of these decisions that we read about in the newspaper and sometimes get very angry about. In any case, thanks very much. I wish you a lot of luck. Thank I think you. you're going to be terrific. Thank you. It's Mike is soon. wonderful, and I really appreciate your thanks. coming. Thanks. Thank you. Ooh. My next guest is Alan Martin, and he, like many of the uh, people in law enforcement. Uh, I actually met him. I wrote him a letter and asked him to come on, on the show. Actually, uh, I was surprised at what an um, open and uh, how uh, interested he was in sharing with all of us what he does. I mean, many of us only meet state troopers on the highway uh, if we are stopped for speeding. And um, it's often not a very pleasant and mostly uncomfortable situation. But I have to say that these gentlemen have uh, do a lot more than that. And uh, I would like to um, introduce my next guest, Alan Martin. And uh, he came here from Middletown, New York. And um, thanks a lot for making the trip and coming my down to, to Kingston to join me. <laughs> um, I was very interested in knowing um, how you did your family encourage you to go into law enforcement? Like, no, I, how I think, <coughs> pardon me, I think I was one of the uh, lucky youth. When I grew up, my parents encouraged me to do whatever I wanted to do. There was no pressure on me to go into law enforcement. Uh, what did your father do? Neither do I have anybody mm -hmm. in law enforcement. My father is a retired concert violinist, and he worked... Uh, for the New York City Opera and the New York City Ballet for many, many years. He was the concert master for the New York City Opera, <laughs> and he was the assistant concert Ooh. master for the New York City Ballet. In addition, he did a lot of commercial work. And um, my mother is a uh, ex-rockette. Well, I don't know if, I don't know if hey. you could ever say ex-rockette. <laughs> Once a rockette, always a rockette. She um, has owned and operated a dancing school since 1968. Where? And is still in New York City. Oh, in really? Oh, and is still working today. So, so she teaches dance. That's correct. And Tap, jazz, and ballet. And I, <coughs> I'm led to believe this is her last year. <laughs> and I wanted to get out of the city. It's time. Mm -hmm. And my father's retired. He had a shoulder problem. So my family is not from no. a police No. I mean, now, th what did all. they say? What did they at say all. when you said you wanted to go into law enforcement be? I mean, you're the head well, of five counties of state troopers. I mean, that's sort of, uh, did they ever think their son would <laughs> end up in this position? No, I, I don't, I don't hmm. think so. Um, I grew up, I was born and raised in New York City. We, we grew up in Upper Manhattan, uh, went to grammar school and high school in Manhattan. And then, uh, while going to college, I did two years of city college, um, it was a matter of just really deciding what I wanted to do and where I wanted to go. And I think everybody at that age, right. around 19, 20, it's a big decision and uh, there's a lot of uncertainty. And I certainly went through a lot of that. And I went from college into construction. Um, I think they were more concerned about the trade I was working at the time. I was an iron worker and mm -hmm. had worked on the structural steel uh, office towers in, in New York City. So at the age of 19, I was 700 feet above the uh, pavement of the city. So <laughs> they were quite concerned about that. But I had an opportunity to get into it. And it was quite a character builder for me. Did that for four and a half years. Um, took the state police test. Was accepted. I almost think it may have been kind of a relief <laughs> that I went to the state police to get off, get, they, at to least get you off. were on the ground. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. Even if you had a gun, you were on the ground. Uh, in, growing up in New York City, um, I saw a tremendous amount and a lot of crime. I witnessed a lot of things firsthand, and it made me want to do something about it. Mm -hmm. I guess it's the old cliche, I wanted to do something. I want to help people. But I can tell you that um, this is my 20th year in the state police. I have been able to do that. I have been able to help people. I have been but able you're to young, you're do You're how something. old? I'm 43. 43, Almost and you're the 44. head? Okay, but you're the head of five counties. That's, that's quite a um, career. I mean, you in Correct. 20 years, a lot of people retire in 20 years at the, in their 
position, and they right. haven't moved that much. So you really, uh, you got into management, I guess, that's is what I'm trying to say. That's <laughs> correct. That's correct. Yeah. And um, there are benefits and there are disadvantages to being in management. I happen to love the job I have right now. What's uh, a typical day? I mean, you're going off after you leave here to, to address a, a dinner for a retiring Secret Serviceman. Correct. But uh, what do you, you do a lot of ver very varied things. Well, first of all, you have to know what the troop I manage is Troop F, and that's the five-county area of Rockland, Orange, Ulster, Sullivan, and Green. Okay. It's approximately 4,000 square miles. I have 461 people that are in my command, including civilians, including the BCI. Um, the way I could describe a typical day is to have somebody pick me up stick me inside a washing machine, <laughs> close the door and turn it on. <laughs> At the end of the day, they open it up. Oh. So, because it is a thousand miles an hour, most days. And, and you never know what's happening. You, you never know what's going to happen. That's part of the fun of police work. You don't mm -hmm. know what's going to happen. The middle of the night calls, as the district attorney referred to, I get from time to time, whether we have uh, serious crimes or shootings. And it is interesting. It is fun because the people that I work with are so competent and do such a wonderful job. Um, All of them? Uh, the vast majority. Yeah. We have our problems, and the reason we have our problems is because we recruit from the human race. See, a lot of people don't understand. They want the police not to have any problems, but we recruit from the human race. Subsequently, we are going to inherit those problems when we employ those people. <laughs> We do the best to With test have, right? and screen mm -hmm. and train and follow up. Nevertheless, no one's perfect. No one's perfect, and we will have problems. So, but in the, other than the example of the washing machine, um, you come in in the morning. I like to get in around 7:30 and go over the past night's activity. Unless it's a Monday, then it's the past weekend's activity. Mm -hmm. Obviously, anything significant should have been brought to my attention by somebody in the field, another commission officer. Now, when you, what crosses your desk? What, what would be an example of some things that cross your desk? I mean, obviously, our little interludes, the average citizen with the state troopers on the highway, those are not crossing your no, desk. No, absolutely not. So what, what Significant arrests, um, deaths, mm -hmm. whether they be homicides, whether they be unattended deaths, whether they be suicides, mm -hmm. whether they be high-speed chases. In these five counties? Exactly. Okay, now, I'm just curious, in terms of domestic violence that occurs in these counties, because I've been doing a lot of work in the family court, that's where I've, I've seen a lot of things going on. What percentage of your work tends to revolve around domestic matters, whether it's violence or you know, calls or, I mean, how involved are state troopers in this, what we call uh, family? Well, state matters? troopers are very involved in responding mm -hmm. to domestic complaints. Mm -hmm. um, we don't have a percentage figure to give you. I can give you some other stats, but um, it is, it has been domestic violence, obviously, if you watch television or read the newspapers, has been a problem not only now, but since the beginning of time. I think now we're just starting to uh, get a, a much better handle on it. We, the Department of Criminal Justice Services, which is responsible for compiling this information, mm -hmm. is now doing a very good job in, in, in getting some statistics together. Uh, I don't have a percentage, what percentage of our cases that the trooper mm -hmm. go, troopers go out to are domestic violence, but what I can tell you, uh, the latest report from DCGS, which is 1997, there were over, just over, 100,000 domestic violence cases that were reported. And that uh, in our five counties? No, this no, is, the, this whole is state, the whole state, including New York City. Now, New York City took up just over 50 percent. Okay. I'd say we could say for Roughly all practical 50%. purposes, 50 percent. So you're talking about 50,000 cases reported in, in the, the rest, rest of, of the state. state. And then, of course, you could break our troop down. Now, our troop, that five-county area, does more police work, takes on more cases for the state police mm -hmm. than any other troop in the state. Why is that? By far. There's a lot of demographics, the location mm -hmm. of the troop, the population, 
there are many, many factors that come into right. play. Right. I remember you had said when I first met you that you were going down to Rockland to work on it. There was a, a murder. That's a, correct. A, a, in fact, I think it was a police officer there was a, who was involved in that well, we shooting had, or something. Well, that, there was an accidental shooting which had occurred up in Hunter. But occasionally what we'll have down in Rockland is sometimes we'll get what we call uh, dump jobs. We have somebody who was killed in one location and dumped off the Palisades Parkway. What do you call them, dump jobs? Well, dump jobs, correct. Somebody, you know, it could be organized yeah. crime hit. Right. But those are difficult cases, and, and we get our, our share of those, too. But um, you don't know what you're going to get on any given day. Of course, we also have to provide support for all the local police departments. Um, if there are any kind of disturbances, um, we can mobilize forces from throughout the state. I see. We have aviation. We have scuba. We have the mobile response team, which is... Uh, known throughout most of the country, other police departments as the SWAT team. Right, we one of the, the state troopers that I know up in my area near Woodstock, he went down when the Flight 800 to okay. on scuba. He was right. dealing with the we scuba. We had a very, very large contingent mm -hmm. of scuba divers throughout the whole state. Matter of fact, just about all of them worked down on that plane crash. That flight yeah, at that one plane point crash. or another. And they did an absolutely yeah, tremendous job. Yeah, I was, I was job surprised. And for a very, very, it was a very trying time. Right. Not only the circumstances surrounding the, 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 the whole incident, but the, the actual working conditions themselves, it's very difficult because the amount of time that they had to spend at the bottom of the ocean. Right, Sifting right. through debris. No, so it was awful. Hats off to them yeah, for doing a tremendous job. Now, uh, another uh, issue that's come up uh, recently has been this uh, profiling which uh, I didn't even know what it was, but uh, there's a lot of question about when you stop somebody for speeding or whatever, uh, are people of color or, you know, getting stopped more frequently because they fit a profile of the type of person who does a certain crime, okay? Now, this has been going on, I don't think particularly in the Hudson Valley, but New Jersey, there's been is issues brought up in the newspaper recently. What do you, how do you handle this? How do you think this can, this kind of thing can be avoided? Be, how can your, how do you see this to prevent your people being accused of doing this kind of thing in the future? I mean, do you instruct your, your people in different? For, first of all, can't speak for the other agencies. Right. I'm not asking. Or, or the allegations mm -hmm. that have been made. But the law is very clear on vehicle and traffic law stops. Um, you cannot stop anybody because of their race or their color. In order to stop somebody, you have to have reasonable suspicion to believe they've committed an offense of the law. And that's it. It's very simple. Our people are trained that way. And they can't search a car? No, they have to have reasonable cause reasonable. to believe there's, there, there, there's more there. And it requires quite a bit of legal intervention to, to because you can't just stop and search a car. Because I remember hearing an interview where uh, an off, uh, a plainclothes police officer who happened to be black was stopped in another state, okay. an interview with him and how he was treated, and it was uh, fairly uh, unbelievable, right. you know, the way he was treated. Well, but again, in another state, I'm not asking you to answer that. that, but I'm just saying that that kind of thing, um, he, w he was from New York, actually. He right. was in New York, and he was, obviously it wasn't, you know, or something he was even familiar with. But when, when you are stopped, what advice would you give the average person and how to, you know, what to do and not to do well, uh, to I avoid? <laughs> I would say the average person who gets stopped, mm -hmm. um, the first, the natural reaction is the heart's pounding. Obviously, they're wound up. First of all, relax. You don't know why you got stopped. Uh, be cooperative. Try to maintain your calm. Um, have your documents ready, because that's what right. the most, whether it be the state police or the local police, that is generally the first thing they're going to ask you. And uh, be cooperative, and, and, and you, you may ask, you know, why you were stopped. But, but try to be polite and relaxed. And most of the time, if it's for a minor offense, mm -hmm. then the world's not going to come to an end. <laughs> I can remember getting stopped. You can remember getting stopped. This I've is good to hear. I've got tickets before. Yeah, in New York City, and um, when you're 19, um, you get wound up and you want to know why, and so I, I've been through it. 
So, I mean, I look back on the, the, the few tickets I got before I got on the job, and I realized, geez, I, I probably didn't handle myself properly. And the thing is to, to, to remain calm. Yeah. To try not to get excited well, and ask do. for an explanation. <laughs> and I think you'll people find do. the troopers are going to provide you with an explanation. Yeah. No, that's good. So. Well, listen, I, I had to ask you that. You no know. problem. That's how most of us meet you guys. But anyway, I, I really appreciate your coming down from Middletown. No You've problem. been terrific. And uh, good luck tonight. Thank you very much. Really. It's great to meet you. Pleasure to meet you, John. Take care Thank now. you. Have a good trip. <laughs> I just wanted to remind people oh. that next Saturday, that's March 20th, there's going to be a travel expo in New Windsor at Anthony's Pier 9. And it should be quite interesting. There's going to be a variety of activities for the whole family. And any of you out there who are looking for something to do on the weekend might consider taking a trip to the Newburgh area. Uh, that's New Windsor Anthony's Pier 9 Restaurant and Catering Hall. Um, my next guest is Hope Nemiroff. And she has come here from uh, Benedictine Hospital. She's involved in a pesticide study and this is a study that's been long awaited by many people. Uh, our area, the Hudson Valley, as many of you know, is renowned for apples. And apples cannot be grown in orchards, they tell me, without the use of many chemicals. This has been a worrisome fact of life for many of us here in the region because it seems that there is a link to these sprayings of the corn, the apples, and other items with, with pesticides. I will like to introduce Hope Nemiroff, and she'll tell us more about her research and what she is doing to enlighten the public and maybe prevent what is an epidemic of cancer, or seems to be. Thank you for joining me, Hope. Hi. Hi. Um, well, I'd like to preface this by saying I was asked to join this study for about four years ago, and I myself am a breast cancer patient, I decided to go my own way doing treatments and brought in so many studies to back up what I wanted to do that Dr. Feldman asked me if I was interested in being a part of the study. Now, Dr. Feldman is the man who he's, I know he's a renowned breast he, surgeon. He's the man. <laughs> breast cancer <laughs> surgeon. But he, didn't his sister die of breast cancer and he started yes. the breast center at Benedictine as yes. I understand it, is his that correct? Yes, his sister died of breast cancer I don't know how many years ago and um, he and his parents had the Fern Feldman Analog Breast Center built in her memory and um, but he's, he's very committed to besides just breast surgery to, to doing all the newest things so when, when we sat down. Now he asked me to join the study because he said patients have different ways of looking at things than doctors do. And I was really knocked out by that, but it is true. It is true that we do look at things differently. Well, there was a movie about the doctor who got cancer and that dealt with a lot of that, yes. which was a very interesting movie actually because of that. Right. It, all of a sudden it was, right. he was the patient, right. you know. And it was getting done to him, all these oh, it won't hurt that much, oh, you know. I mean, how many women do I know that had half their lymph nodes taken out that can't move their arms anymore, you know? There are treatments and treatments, and then, then you read in the, in the newspaper, the newest way of cancer prevention is, um, what do they call it, um, mastectomy, preventative mastectomy. Yeah, well, I have a, a friend who did that. Yes. Uh, her mother had it, her sister had it. She was lived in fear of it constantly and she went and had a double mastectomy at the age of 47 right. I called her up she was never happier I mean it it was a very interesting approach but she lived with the specter of cancer so right. there's a lot of with that gene if you have it you, you I can't say I can't imagine doing that but I'm not confronted she's been living for 25 years worrying about it so five per, five percent of women have the gene. Only 5% of women who get breast cancer and the biggest risk mm -hmm. factor is having breasts. So, <laughs> I mean, that, no. that is a quote from Dr. Feldman and that's the truth. Well, tell me about what you, I know you were in Albany on Monday lobbying yes. for this cause, but 
tell me what the pesticide study is going. I mean, I had uh, an apple grower on one of my shows to talk about, the, I, to hear their side of the story, and also to present how I feel as a citizen ingesting these things. Because, but let me ask you this: What? I mean, obviously chemicals aren't great, but you can't grow corn and apples without them. I mean, I. But it's frightening. I was in New Paltz at a press mm -hmm. uh, breakfast, at a bed and breakfast, and. On the terrace, we were having tea, and there was a stench of chemicals wafting across the terrace. Now, it was, should I take them out of my guidebook, this bed and breakfast? Because I know that the chemicals are going into the aquifer, and people yes. are drinking the water, and I was drinking the tea. What I'm asking you is, what can be done? What are you finding? I'm very excited about the research. Well, I can't tell you particular <laughs> yeah. pesticides or chemicals, but what I can tell you, and this is... Unofficially, I've been told that our preliminary results are that the women with cancer have five times the amount of DDE. Now, DDE is... It's a breakdown from DDT. T, okay. That's that the women without cancer, then the women without cancer. Now, that's pretty scary. And DDT <coughs> was banned within the last decade, I believe, wasn't no, it? No, it was longer ago than was that. Was it? It's about 25 years ago, I believe. In the 70s, it was banned in the so 70s. So, the, this has gotten into people's bodies for many, many years. I mean, it's still in the food chain. In it's effect, still in right? the food chain, and I, can, I have a personal story about that. When I joined the study, I decided to, on my own, have my pesticide levels tested. Just a blood test. I come back with two and a half times normal DDT, which I wasn't happy about. And I found a protocol, a sauna, a sauna detox, and I did it, and I lowered my levels by 66%. And then I followed up the test, and a year later, I tested again, and I was recontaminated. And I'm looking at my diet saying, what could it possibly be? I'm eating organic food. I'm just drinking filtered water. I have fish a few times a week. And I was drinking a non-organic green tea from the health food store. I had it tested by the same lab that does testing for Long Island Breast Cancer Study, and it has DDT in it. I drink green tea every day. Don't you? And I am, yes. I, I, I like it. I'm not doing, even doing it for health reasons, but that, what, when you tell me this, I should go read the label you on won't my find green anything, tea. You won't find anything on the label. That's the it problem. It says green tea from the Orient. Now, who knows what they put in the tea in the Orient? I mean, we have laws about this, well, but we, anything that's in, we, ban certain chemicals, but that doesn't prevent us from selling them overseas. Right. They use them on the crops, and then we import those That's same right. items. And our government does not protect us. It does not put on any of those labels, this has been sprayed with DDT. So the only way to be absolutely safe is only drink organic tea. Now, I switched yeah. back to an organic tea, and six months later had a follow-up test. And how are the DDT levels? My levels went down. So it's an, you know, it, it's... So can anyone get this blood test? I mean, can well, anybody out there just go and get a blood test to test their DDT levels? I mean, this, this lab, I'm not sure. New York State has funny licensing laws. So they may not take it from a doctor in New York State. They take it from Dr. Feldman because he's doing all this research. I see. So, so, you, so you may not, the average person can't just walk in and get the test. Yes. But then again, if you feel that you are at risk, you could contact the breast center yes. and Dr. Feldman's office and they right. could tell you. Right. Um, do you, what do you feel can be done uh, legally to uh, lower the use of these chemicals in our region? I mean, we are a pocket of cancer in yes, this we area. Are. New Paltz, this Hudson Valley, Ulster County area, as I remember reading, is an area where there are high cancer rates. Is that correct? Um, we're not sure exactly how high our cancer rate, and that's one, one of the reasons I was up in Albany was to lobby for cancer mapping in New York State, which uh, Governor Pataki gave a million dollars in the state budget. The state to map out the hot spots the in hot our spots. state. Like Long Island, they found, was a hot spot for breast cancer, correct? And a hot spot for a lot of chemicals and a hot spot for radiation and a hot spot for a lot of other things. And it only has one aquifer, so they know that <coughs> all the water is contaminated. Well, we need to know where the rest of the hot spots are. And not only does the Hudson Valley have a lot of cancer, but I think we're going to find that a lot of our young people have MS. 
and maybe with all this mapping we're going to be able to find what chemicals or at least begin to find what mm -hmm. chemicals are responsible so the cancer mapping is important the state board of health has been a little slow in implementing it then they decided that they wanted to do it by county rather than zip code now it can't be done by less than zip code meaning that there are blocks and as we well known in Woodstock near the old Rotron there's blocks where everybody had cancer right I know in Olive are you talking about in Olive or West Hurley West Hurley I mean if you did that by county you would show nothing however if you did it by zip code you'd show an awful lot more and then if you do it down to neighborhoods once you look in the zip codes you're gonna find out a lot of information and we need that information and we pay taxes for that information so that's one of the reasons we were up there and and then also the neighborhood um, pesticide notification that if your neighbor uses pesticides they should be required to put up a sign 48 hours in advance so you I are see. warned that's so if a farmer is spraying his acreage or her acreage they would have to put up a sign and now aerial spraying is not covered in this. Because that's really the big terrible problem. Terrible. Uh, as I understand it, especially the corn mm -hmm. spraying. Okay. Um, but the, if you can't, I mean, the guy doing his lawn next door to you, 50 feet of lawn or an acre even, but then you look at these corn fields in Hurley and elsewhere, I mean, they go on for acres and acres and acres. Acres and acres and acres and so, wind drift and, and, you right. know, and how many people get sprayed in the morning when, you know, the farmer's up there. We're at the beginning of, of starting on this problem. And um, there's one farmer who sprays for a lot of other farmers and doesn't, he doesn't really like to be criticized and has one woman in court fighting you know, fighting a lawsuit because uh, she doesn't want to have her property sprayed. I mean, well, she shouldn't have to. She shouldn't know. have to. And the problem is, is that even with your neighbor spraying his lawn next door, there mm -hmm. are so many wells that are close. I mean, you're required to have your well and your septic 100 feet from each other now. But if your neighbor is 20 feet away and he sprays his lawn and it's 20 feet away from your well, no, there's no law for there's that. No law. So this is going to be a long-term mm -hmm. project that you're involved in. Very long-term. Is there anything that you feel the average citizen like me or people out there watching can do well, uh, to help? One thing everybody can do to help is to give money. Um, New York State has a checkoff on your New York State income tax and it's tax deductible and that is the only way breast breast cancer research in this state is funded and the research um, looks at environmental looks at everything looks at education we are now broke <laughs> I sat on the health research science board for this last year mm -hmm. and we spent all the money you know um, so we need everybody out there to check off it's check a dollar it or you check off whatever you, whatever can, you give. can give whatever I mean um, if you can give ten that's ten dollars off your you know your New York State tax right. it's tax deductible and we are now after the legislature so if you're getting a refund they will take it off your refund or if you're getting you right. know if you have to pay you can they'll just add it on right well that you know that sounds very reasonable I mean we're all affected by this and everybody's um, affected I mean it, everybody has mothers daughters you know sisters and that's just for breast cancer when we find breast cancer we're going to it's it will will have a big answer for prostate cancer I mean it, and it's all going to be connected to chemicals and everything else so wherever we can attack it from no it seems that that is the as mm -hmm. I see it is is the ep it's epidemic and it's growing it's not, and as our generation ages the baby boom uh, as we age cancer will be even more prevalent because I think breast cancer rates do go up with age they do. 50, 60. If you look, it's significantly higher mm -hmm. in women over 50, over 60, over 70. I right. mean, in terms of, I guess if you're around, something's going to get you, but it seems that that's uh, right. one of the things. Right. But um, no, I will definitely look on my tax return as Thank I you. file, <laughs> and I hope all of you out there will do the same. And tell, um, your, tell your accountants, please. That's right. 
many account. I mean, some people, my sister uses a, a lady accountant, but not that women necessarily are more sensitive to that than the men, but all accountants. I mean, it would be nice if maybe even the newspaper can put something in, you know, before. Well, I did call one of our local <laughs> newspapers today about this mm -hmm. and was told that that's not much of a story. Yeah. Well, it ain't much of a story unless it's happening to that's you, right? right. That's right. <laughs> hey, that's great. You know, some journalists yes. make real, it's like politically insensitive right. comments. Listen, thanks for joining me, Hope. I really wish okay. you a lot of luck with this. This is one of my pet peeves, you know, like the, this whole chemical thing. I mean, it's been like that for me for 30 years. I've been concerned. Mm -hmm. So I really wish you a lot of luck with that. And um, you'll come back, I hope, and let yes. us know maybe in a year what's happened. Yes. Okay. Eat organic. That it doesn't even cost that much more anymore. No, not anymore. Look in your health food store. It really right. doesn't. Sometimes it's cheaper than the Grand Union. And that'll so. send a big message. Yeah, that will. <laughs> that is true. Thanks again. Okay. Good luck. Thanks for joining Thanks. me. I just wanted to once again thank my sponsor, Swedish Solutions Auto Repair, that specializes in Saabs and Volvos located off the Thruway Traffic Circle in Kingston. For their support, they sponsor this program. And I also want to just uh, tell you my last but not least guest who is going to join me momentarily is Rick Orlando. Uh, he is a very special member of the Woodstock community where I live. He owns and operates a marvelous restaurant called New World Home Cooking. And if you have not been there, you should make sure you get there, uh, no matter where you live in the Hudson Valley. Uh, Rick is truly, if you ask him what the cuisine is, which I will do, he will tell you it is eclectic, it changes, it's, it's very exciting. Going there for dinner is truly an experience. So with no further ado, I'd like to introduce Rick and Thank him for coming here, leaving the kitchen behind, at least uh, for a few minutes. I'll be back. I'll be back. <laughs> He'll be back Don't with his fret. apron. I'm on the stove anyway. tonight. <laughs> anyway, um, so you, how long have you been in Woodstock? Wait, wait, I remember. Wait, I watched the first three guests. I'm going to try to sit a little taller, okay? <laughs> <laughs> well, Mama. you know what a power trip I'm on. Really? I'm going to have my television show yes. here. Um, so tell me, well, I know you have a TV show also, don't you? Are you we, are, we are shopping a, a show to public television right now. We have an offer to do the show. We're looking for underwriting, about 150000 Anybody want to back <laughs> it? That's, uh, that's where it is right now. It should be by this time next year, we should have a public television show going. Great. Yeah. And uh, so how long have you been in Woodstock now? God, it seems like a long time, but uh, it's not 93, been... 93. Oh, you know. so, so six years. Yeah. yeah. We, my wife, Liz, and I... Uh, moved to the moved upstate out of the city. We met in Boston, um, had one child, moved to New York because she was raised in New York, I was raised in New Haven, and we always thought, boy, wouldn't it be cool to raise our kids in the city? And after about a year of that, we said, this is not the same city that we grew up in. This is a different city. Taking your little soft and sweet two-year-old down Second Avenue. And, East Village and saying, Daddy, why is that man bleeding on the sidewalk? You say, okay, we're going upstate. <laughs> so we ended up in, uh, I worked in, I looked for work in the Hudson Valley and in the Capital District. I got a job in Albany, but we lived in Greene County. So we were in between. We had a business in Tannersville for a while, and uh, we decided that Woodstock was where we wanted to raise our kids. What made you pick Woodstock? It's where we wanted to raise our kids. It's a great place for community. Um, now you have three children. I have right three. Now, right? Margo, Willie, and Terry, and uh, my youngest is five, Margo's 12, Willie's 10. And uh, it's a great place to raise children because though there are some environmental issues in the Hudson Valley in general, compared to living in a big city, it's a wonderful place for the kids to be. Um, we love the community. There's a lot of energy. The great thing about Woodstock is that you get both elements. You get the country in your physical environment, and you get the city in your personal environment. That's and a that's good way to really put it. Good, that's a real know? good way to yeah, put it. Because we lived in Greene <laughs> County, and it was just as beautiful. But, you know, I, I, I couldn't take up banjo. I tried, you know, it just wasn't for me. Yeah. So I decided that I'd move to Woodstock instead. <laughs> <laughs> it's, well, as, a, as an, a fellow member of that community, mm -hmm. it is truly a, a melting pot yeah, village, Yeah, it's a lot of right? fun, you know? It is a lot of fun. I mean, it's, it's a, a lot very of interesting uh, 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 It's I frenetic, mean, have, but it's I a lot of fun. I have a friend who's fairly well known. Mm -hmm. And uh, I will not mention his name, but he says to me, ah, you go through that town, it's filthy, the streets are dirty. There's a, what is that, Woodstock? You know, 
Yeah, but Compared you know, I what? know. Uh, well, it's true. Yeah. But I said, yeah, that's the Woodstock the tourist sees. But when you live there, mm -hmm. you see the people, and you can know the people in the community, even, and even it is downtown quite Woodstock remarkable. Woodstock, in the grand scheme of things, is really a clean little town, considering the thousands of people that go through that town well, day in and day it's, out, it's compared still, to, Well, compared you know, to New England, between New and Compared to any little not, tourist town. It's not kept so pristine, but that's, and a lot of people claim that that's part of its uh, yeah, charm say, also. That's good. Have that been it's to not a New England village. If you want a New England village, you can go to New England. Well, like those little <laughs> so, towns in the Berkshires where no. everyone is obligated by law to have the same dark green and brown sign. Yes, I mean, exactly. We don't, we don't live don't there. That. That's, we look, don't have that. Look at you. Look at me. Are we yes. going to have dark green and <laughs> brown signs? No. <laughs> is anyone going to tell us what to do? No. Well, someone has that's told right. me that that town is filled with people who did not learn how to play well together in kindergarten. And that may well be the truth. But in any case, it's a very interesting community. So tell me. But they what played well alone. <laughs> they played well alone. <laughs> we all did that well. Yes. That's true. Yes. So what do you think? Um, you're, now, you moved into a new space. It is absolutely fantastic. You, your restaurant is in, enlarged now. Yes. It's and it's actually physically in Saugerties on Route 212, right. just outside of Woodstock. But it, what um, you took that place, that space, and you redid it. It is just fantastic. The Thanks. artwork, the feeling, the bar, everything. It's we, wonderful. We had a, it was a really great um, experience. My wife, Liz, is a great natural designer, and she knows how to surround herself with people that will just do everything for it. Um, we had some great help. We had great artists. And her vision is very clear, is to be alive, is to make the place be alive. Well, the colors are fantastic. And they're there to make you feel good. And you, you know? also have changing artwork, changing we have, artists. We have, well, uh, Justin Love um, and Laurie Goodhart are two lo uh, artists that are basically house artists that are in. Sylvia Ruth Weinberg is in the catering room um, right now. That, that show changes. Um, but Lori and Justin have been really supportive. Um, and we've had uh, Tom Socker, a lot of artists, just, they want to be a part of the place. Yeah. They show yeah. up and they say, can I hang something here? And we say, well, let's, let's work it out. Let's see what can work, what can't. Um, what Liz has been trying to put across, and me also, is to remember that we're there to, you go out to eat, going out to eat now is the night out, you know. In, right, in it's the experience. 20 years ago it was dinner and a movie, dinner and a show, dinner and dancing. Now it's dinner. Well, tell me about the menu, because we, we don't have a huge amount of time. I could okay. talk. What do you, uh, how would you describe the cuisine? Because this is my problem. When I try to tell people, if you have one meal to eat, mm -hmm. go there, because it's so different. So how would you describe Well, in, in the industry it's called, uh, the, uh, fusion cuisine is a term that's used a lot, um, American regional. Um, what I basically do is I lived in Boston, New York City, D.C., New Haven, Albany, all little political centers where people from all around the world kind of congregate and all around the country congregate. So there's a lot of influences. My idea of a learning experience in food is not to go to the $48 a plate restaurant, but it's to go into the back neighborhood, into the soul food restaurant or the El Salvadorian restaurant or the Argentinian restaurant and see what the world is eating, what they've brought to our culture. That's why they call it fusion or melting pot. Then I take the, those ideas and I don't claim to or try to recreate them exactly as if you're having an authentic Cuban dish. It's fusion. It's just like music. I hear a little world beat. I pick up my guitar. I'm not King Sonny a day. I grew up playing the blues and rock and roll. It's got a different feel to it. So I'm making a fusion of my interpretations of what I taste and what I see out there. And it's fun for me because it's not I'm not doing, I, I, someone said to me, you can have the best business in the world, you have to make veal parmesan sandwiches all day and all night, I would be in a different business. I'm in this business because I'm allowed to experiment. Um, you know, we have what we it's call It's like creative writing. It's Instead like creative writing. Instead of hack writing, writing well, you know, for the newspaper, We right? have our hack Very dishes, which are excellent. <laughs> we have our basic house specialties menu because we have found... Well, that's what if you bring your mother. Or well, you bring, no, not you bring just the mother. We have people that come for jerk chicken, and if jerk okay. chicken was off the menu, there'd be a revolution in Woodstock. But... At the same time, I do my daily menu where I shop the market. I do what I, what I feel like doing. Some weeks it's, uh, it'll be all in an Asian bent. Some weeks it's all over the place. Some weeks in the summer when you the organic... Because you have specials every that, day. Well, that's my little yeah, daily project. Daily I do that thing. every day. And a lot of that is dependent on what's in the market. The organic farmers may show up with 
you know, three pounds of plate boiled potatoes, two white eggplants, six <laughs> yellow peppers, and I, I and go in the kitchen think. and say, hmm, what's for dinner tonight? And you then know? you try to remember what you had at that Salvadorian restaurant there you in are. the back of Boston, and, and then had, I what did they do with those purple get eggplants? Cheesy old power book in the kitchen and try to keep track of everything because you know we we I do all the menus and stuff are filed and logged, so we keep track of it all for the big book. Really, that's yeah. great. Yeah, yeah. So you're working on a cookbook? Yeah, the book is. Uh, well underway. What's I, it going to be called? It's going to be called New World Home Cooking. World? No, I'm sorry. Take that back. New World's Greatest Hits. World Beat Recipes oh. from the Woodstock Cafe. Oh, great. And uh, I, I did something. I was advised from some other chefs who've had successful books. That, you know, you have a life, you have a wife, you have a kid, three kids, you have a family. I'm out doing stuff with the chefs collaborative. I'm on the radio. How am I going to write a book? Well, I hired a partner named Sharon Moore. She's a, a professional writer. She writes in Woman's Day. You know, mm -hmm. she, she's a cookbook writer. She's a cookbook writer, not just, but an, you know, a journalist. And uh, we have an agreement. I give her tons of information. She puts it into some kind of format that mm -hmm. makes sense, and then I completely color that format with my own voice. And it's a back and forth through email thing, which works great. Oh, really? Yeah, so we she's have a not even in town. She's in Westchester. Oh, that's great. I have a great agent and uh, a great agency ready to publicize the book, and hopefully. We're very close to announcing some stuff that I can't announce, but hopefully by next year at this time the book will be in the stores. It takes wow, a long time. That's a long time. If it takes usually a year. It does take. It takes a year when you deliver the completed book finished to the publisher. So well, yeah, maybe it will be a later. A year from year. that. So they're I hoping. Hate, they're hoping for spring of two thousand. Yeah. We hired. Uh, we're in the process of working out an agreement with a, an agency that is the best. They handle all the all of the chefs that you know. Mm -hmm. Um, like the, the Silver Palette people, and, uh, people the, like and Emerald, and, and mm -hmm. Coyote Cafe, and all the chefs that are that are having fun doing this um, are handled by one agency, and you kind of audition for them. <laughs> now, did you also use the internet? Uh, the one thing that struck me about what you're doing is you use the internet a lot. You're yeah. one of the first people who really got involved with that with your business. Yeah, we had a website since '95. Right, um, which is so it was early. It was there. I mean, to mm -hmm. me, if you're not using the web. How do you you're specifically like not using use it. You're riding that. a horse to me. If you're not reading, you're riding I'm a horse. I'm riding a horse. <laughs> you, should be, you should be online. I am. Well, my 15-year-old son designs is, websites. Yeah, I mean, it's... So it, he's got certain aspects of it. But what I'm saying is I don't know how to get on the Internet. He does it for me. You he press gets dial. It. Buy an iMac. Boom. One button, you know? But <laughs> we easy. won't go there. Yeah. But what I'm interested in is how... what. Aspects of your business that you find the internet most useful for? Well, I do, like I was saying, a lot of uh, appearances on radio, public mm -hmm. radio, local radio stations, television, national, semi national, regional. Um, whenever I do that, my website address is there newworldhomecooking.com, um, all yeah. small letters. Mm -hmm. I'm able to c develop correspondence and get feedback on a grand scale. When I do the Today Show, I get between three and four hundred letters instantly, like to see the time the emails came in, I might spot maybe 851 to 857, and you'll see on my email, 901, 901, 901, mm -hmm. 901, 901 902, no, you know, that people are immediately responding, and it's phenomenal. And it also is, uh, it's great for, people say, what kind of food do you cook? And I say, well, right. go to newworldhomecooking.com right. and click on the menu, and, and it's no. great. I mean, I'm able to express a lot of, you know, basic advertising, but also basic communication. Um, it, it is... To me. Do you know that what's, I'm asking you also because when I'm updating my guidebook, The Best mm -hmm. of the Hudson Valley and Catskill Mountains, Absolutely. which, well, should be online, but w the thing is, I'm thinking now, not only do I have to have the name of the restaurant, the phone number, mm -hmm. the address, the hours, but I got to have the email address oh, yeah. because I think that's something that a lot of people, w I mean, people, we will never, ever go beyond the time when people don't want a travel book in their car when they're traveling. Mm -hmm. They just want to have that. Then I, well, I mean, use at the some internet point. also. We get a lot of people up from the city. You know, I'm not anti-tourist because I know that oh, even though there not. are tourists <laughs> out there that are paying, mm -hmm. a lot of really good people who come and stay in the area that you've become friends with, like me, like you, we were not born on Tinker Street. No, we were not. You know, we discovered Woodstock in our travels and decided this is a good place to live. Or we discovered Rensselaerville, or we discovered right. Schoharie County. That's how, you, you know, for every person who's there just to, to buy a tie-dye t-shirt, there's someone who may be a great contributor to the area. So I, I, I think that the Internet is a great tool for that. Mm -hmm. uh, they had a Woodstock Chamber meeting today, and Ken Schneidman's doing a great job with the Woodstock online site 
people call, are coming up from the city. They go to they look up Woodstock. They I get see. Woodstock right online. On. They could make their hotel reservations. They can get a feel. There's like a, a little walking tour, like a video tour of town, downtown. That's you great. can get restaurant mm -hmm. menus and not just lodging and restaurants, but a lot of the culture and a lot of the ideas of Woodstock are online. If you go in, on the web and search Woodstock, there's poetry, there's artist sites. I mean, there's a lot of really great stuff that's... that's there's more than even you'd want to know. But well, that's part yeah, of Woodstock. how hungry you are. But anyway, well, listen, thanks for coming by. It mm -hmm. was great to talk to you. Yeah. I know you have to run off and start preparing for dinners. Well, but, you know, it's nice that you can sort of sit down. I'm always seeing you in the restaurant running around, so But it's I'm always nice. talking, so it's oh, not much different. Well, so am I. <laughs> anyway, thanks again, Rick, for coming Thank by. You. And, you know, good luck Bye. with your new endeavors here. Uh, Thank you very much for joining me today. Mm -hmm. I hope you will continue to tune in to my show. I have many members of the Ulster and Duchess and other counties in the Hudson Valley coming to join me to talk about some serious issues and controversial ones. Uh, again, I want to thank Swedish Solutions that specializes in Saabs and Volvos for their support. They are sponsoring this show. Thank you, and thanks for tuning in. Good night.